everybody, welcome to our next segment um, in our exploration of Egyptian art. In this video, we're going to be looking at the Amarna period. Um, this started in the New Kingdom around 1350 BCE. And this is probably one of the most interesting periods in Egyptian art because we actually see some stylistic changes and innovations occurred. In the New Kingdom, the divine kingship of the pharaohs was now asserted in a new way by association with the god Amun, whose identity had been fused with the sun god Ra, and who became the supreme deity ruling lesser gods, much as the pharaoh towered above the um, provincial nobility. Um, this very development produced an unexpected threat to royal authority. The priests of Amun grew into a caste of such wealth and power that the pharaoh could maintain um, his position only with their consent. Um, Amhotep, um, the most remarkable figure of the 18th dynasty, and I'm sorry, this is Amhotep the fourth, um, tried to defeat them by proclaiming his faith in a single god, the sun disk Aten. He changed his name to Akhenaten, closed the Amun temples, and moved the capital to central Egypt near present-day Amarna. So this is actually a city. Um, he attempts to place himself at the head of a new monotheistic faith, so it's you know, very interesting because they shift from a polytheistic religion to a monotheistic religion. So his attempt to place himself at the head of a new monotheistic faith, however, did not outlast his reign, which was between 1365 and 1347 BC. And under his successors, um, the orthodoxy was speedily returned. So they returned back to sort of the old... Um, the old faith, the polytheistic faith, and also the, the stylistic conventions as well. During the long decline that began around 1000 BCE, the country became increasingly priest-ridden um, until under the Greek and Roman rule, Egyptian civilization came to an end um, in a welter of esoteric um, religious doctrines. So um, this is a figure, um, a colossal figure of Akhenaten. Um, so I want you to look at it, and I want you to think about maybe some differences from the statues that we looked at uh, with the Old Kingdom um, pharaohs. So I'll give you a minute to kind of look and think about it. So here is one of those statues from the Old Kingdom. And um, Akhenaten claimed to be both the son and the sole prophet of Aten. During his rule, profound changes occurred in Egyptian art. A colossal, a colossal statue of him um, from Karnak retains the standard frontal pose of canonical um, pharaonic portraits, but the effeminate body with its curvy contours and long face with full lips and heavy lidded eyes are very much unconventional. Um, as far removed from the very heroic kind of proportioned figures of the pharaoh um, predecessors. So again, we, we really see quite a difference. So the frontality exists, um, but definitely this, this sort of serpentine shape, um, even this like serp, you know, this kind of belly protruding out, you know, he doesn't have an idealized figure. Um, and his face is, you know, very long. Um, so very, very different, um, remarkably different than, um, the statues that we see um, from the Old Kingdom. And you have to remember, too, that, you know, remember the Egyptians prided themselves on permanency, um, stability, um, and so, you know, their their way of um, portraying um, royalty didn't change for thousands of years. And then here we have this brief period where it does change, and we're going to explore some theories as to, as to why that happened. So Akhenaten... Um, Again, is curiously mishappened, shaped with weak arms and a very narrow waist, um, the protruding belly. He also has wide hips and fatty thighs, so he, he looks almost like a fertility figure. Um, some scholars believe the ruler might have suffered from some physical ailment causing his deformity. Others believe it is a deliberate artist reaction against the established style. It is believed that Akhenaten artists tried to formulate a new androgynous image of the pharaoh as the manifestation of Aten, the sexless sun disk. 
So some scholars think it might have been, you know, documenting maybe a disease or some sort of deformity he had. And others believe that, and this is what I find interesting, that it was a deliberate stylistic innovation or shift, um, you know, to really kind of move away from um, the traditions of the old kingdom. And it really shows you how important art can be um, in expressing that shift. So here's a relief carving of Akhenaten. And you, again, you can sort of see the the long neck and the protruding chin, the really full lips, and again, he's pretty recognizable. So we, we see his image um, in this style is very distinct. So Akhenaten was a very unique ruler in Egyptian history, um, and this is a relief car carving known as Akhenaten and his family, um, and it does show some of Akhenaten's beliefs and how Egyptian art changed in response to them. Um, so again, Akhenaten radically realigned Egyptian religious cults. Um, he suppressed traditional worship of most deities in favor of a cult centered on the sun god, Aten. He also proclaimed himself head of this cult. Thus, we see him and his family under the sun's benevolent rays right here. So we're going to kind of analyze some of the iconography of this work. Even the name he adopted reflects his new religious orientation. It means effective... Um, for the Aten. Um, this work is made out of limestone and, and it's carved in what is a, a technique referred to as sunken relief. Um, in sunken relief, um, the represented scene is carved away from the top plane, that is the opposite of most reliefs, which protrude from a lower background. So that's the difference. Um, we see Akhenaten here and he's kissing his daughter in a very tender gesture. So we have Akhenaten here, and we have um, Queen Nefertiti over here, who was his wife, and they both have these very slender necks and these, you know, these kind of curvy bodies, and even the children demonstrate um, this feature as well. Um, let's see. So when we look at the facial features and the proportions of the bodies, um, they really do depart um, from the conventions of old Egyptian art. Um, this new style is often called the Amarna style, named for the city of Amarna. Um, getting back to the rays of the sun, they end in a kind of um, abstract representation of hands here. Um, and... Um, some of the hands hold the looped cross known as an ankh, um, an Egyptian symbol of life. Thus, the sun is giving life to the ruler and his family. Um, the implication is that the king's special relationship to the chief god ensures um, Egypt's safety and success. Um, it's important, too, to note that we see a daughter, you know, that sits on the queen's lap um, right over here, and she's pointing... Um, and her gesture um, is um, traditionally stood for warding off evil, um, this sort of pointing gesture. Um, the hieroglyphic, remember, often figures were identified by different hieroglyphic inscriptions, gives her, gives her name, which is Meketaten. <laughs> Um, inscriptions give um, praise to the sun. Additional inscriptions give praise to the sun and to the royal couple as mediators between the sun and the people. So again, we see this sort of elevation of, of you know, the pharaoh really trying to deify himself and his investiture that his right to rule comes from the divine. The queen's throne is decorated with symbols of Upper and Lower Egypt. So we have the papyrus plant and the um, plant. Remember those two symbols um, are the symbols of the unification of um, Lower and Upper Egypt. We've seen that iconography before. Um, and so we also see... Um, that, you know, what's interesting or what scholars find interesting about this, this relief sculpture is that it really portrays the king and queen in a very um, relaxed sort of, um, 
you know, almost sort of an intimate scene um, of a family sort of just enjoying each other. Um, so it, it's it's kind of seen as almost an everyday scene, which would be unusual to sort of view um, a pharaoh end. So we see this indicated by the casual poses. We also see flagons. This was a um, container that was that w that wine was stored in. We see those off to the side. Um, the Amarna period saw um, pronounced increase in portrayals of royal figures in informal situations. So that's another stylistic innovation that you can think about when comparing Old Kingdom and the Am Amarna period. Um, also, getting back, I lost my train of thought. Um, the representation of the papyrus and lotus um, imagery on the, the throne of the, the queen that she sits on is interesting too because she's female. And so some historians take this to mean that she held real power, again, which would have been very unusual at the time. So we don't, we see it on her throne, we don't see it on his. Um, the next ruler, Akhenaten's nephew, Tutankhamun, um, suppressed the cult of Aten and erased um, most references to it um, in public places. Likewise, um, he seized patronage of art in the Amarna style, and the dominant style of Egyptian art return, or those sort of old um, conventions returned to its earlier um, sort of idealized form. Here, what we're looking at are some vandalized images of um, Akhenaten, and again, that's we saw that with. Um, um, Hetsep Shut, you know, her stepson, you know, tried to have her images erased. And usually when there's been some sort of, you know, when a new pharaoh takes over, um, we see sort of the, the new pharaoh trying to kind of um, erase the image of the old one to sort of, um, you know, uphold their dominance, I guess, especially if um, there was disagreement um, or transition, like in this case with the um, the change in religion that was a huge deal um, and caused a lot of um, up, upheaval in Egypt. Um, he even, you know, moved the capital um, to um, Amarna, present-day Amarna, and from Thebes, and this was a big deal. And you know, some think that he did this because, again, you know, this priestly caste um, was starting to get too much wealth and power. And so, you know, Akhenaten decided to change that by sort of establish, establishing himself the only sort of intermediary between him and this new sun god. Time to really talk about this piece, but I did want to show you, because this is a very famous bust of Nefertiti, who was the wife of Akhenaten. Um, and she was described as being incredibly beautiful, as we see here in this, uh, in this bust. Um, you know, some things that are very um, intriguing, again, is this sort of long neck, um, and her facial features are very delicate. Um, some scholars think that this was a, a working bust or, 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 or a bust that um, sculptors would use to, you know, as a model um, to um, create other sculptures and monuments um, dedicated to her. But um, it's really beautiful. Now we're at the period uh, of Tutankhamun um, and the post-Amarna period. Um, probably the most famous figure of the post-Amarna period is Tutankhamun, who was um, Akhenaten's son by a minor wife. He ruled for a decade and died at the age of 18, some believe due to foul play. He is considered a minor figure in Egyptian history, but in art historical terms, the discovery of his tomb with its fabulously rich treasures of sculpture, furniture, and jewelry largely intact has made him a beloved figure in Egyptian art. So Tutankhamun was um, only the age of nine when he became the king of Egypt um, during the 18th dynasty of the New Kingdom. His story would have been lost to us if it, were, if it weren't for the discovery of his tomb in 1922 by the archaeologist Howard Carter in the Valley of the Kings. His nearly intact tomb held a wealth of objects that give us um, unique insights into this period of ancient um, Egyptian history. Um, Tutankhamun ruled after the Amarna age um, when the pharaoh Akhenaten, um, Tutankhamun's um, 
father turned um, the religious attention of the kingdom to the worship of a new god, Aten, um, which was described as a sun disk. Akhenaten moved his capital city to the site of Akhenaten, also known as Amarna, which is um, present-day Amarna in Middle Egypt, um, far from the previous pharaoh's capital. Um, after Akhenaten's death um, and the rule of a short-lived pharaoh, um, Tutankhamun shifted the focus of the country's worship back to the god Amun and returned the religious center back to Thebes. Um, Tutankhamun married his half-sister, um, but they did not produce an heir. This left the line of succession unclear. Tutankhamun died at the young age of 18, leading many scholars to speculate on the manner of his death, chariot accident, murder by a blow to the head, and even a hippopotamus attack have been <laughs> proposed, and the answer is still unclear. Um, and here we see Howard Carter, um, the famous archaeologist, um, you know, sort of looking um, at the inner um, most coffin of Tutankhamun. Um, during the early 20th century, Howard Carter, a British um, Egyptologist, um, excavated for many years in the Valley of the Kings, a royal burial ground located in the west bank of the ancient city of Thebes. He was running out of money to support his archaeological digs when he asked for funding from one more season when he asked for funding for one more season from his from his financial backer um, the fifth earl of um, carnivon lord carnivon granted him one more year and what a year it was um, at the beginning of november 20 november 1922 carter came upon the first of 12 steps of the entrance that led to the tomb of Tutankhamun. He quickly recovered the steps um, and sent a telegram to um, Carnivon in England so that they could open the tomb together. Carnivon departed for Egypt immediately, and on November 26, 1922, they made a hole in the entrance of um, the anti-chamber the anti in order to look in um, in. And this is a quote from Carter himself. At first I could see nothing, the hot air escaping from the chamber causing the candle flame to flicker. But presently, as my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room within emerged slowly from the mist. Strange animals, statues, and gold everywhere, the glint of gold. So, I know, it's, it sucks we don't have a, a color photograph, but say this is it this is what they found and, and again i mean this is incredible to find all of this intact and again really reaffirms this idea of um, the egyptians attitude towards the afterlife that they really spent a lot of effort and time preparing for it and again this idea that these beautiful works of art furniture um sculpture um you know pottery whatever boats <laughs> um were built but never were not meant to be seen. Um, the task of cataloging the finds um, in the tomb was an immense undertaking for the team. Carter spent a decade systematically recording the finds and having them photographed. All right, so one of the most famous um, pieces obviously is the coffin of Tutankhamun. So this is the inner coffin. Um, Tutankhamun sarcophagus, and again, a sarcophagus is a box-like stone container, very similar to a present-day coffin, um, held not only one, but three coffins in which to hold the body of the king. The outer two coffins were crafted in wood and covered in gold, along with many semi-precious stones, such as lapis lazuli and turquoise. The inner coffin, however, was made out of solid gold. When Howard Carter first came upon this coffin, it was not the shiny golden image we see in the Egyptian Museum today, um, like you see here. In his excavation notes, Carter states it was covered with a thick black pitch-like layer, which extended from the hands down to the ankles. This was obviously um, an, an anointing liquid, which had been poured over the coffin during the bur burial ceremonial ceremony and in great quantity, um, they believe maybe two bucketfuls. 
here's a better image. Um, the image of the pharaoh is that of a god. The gods were thought to have um, skin of gold, um, bones of silver, and hair of lapis lazuli. So the king is shown here in his divine form in the afterlife. He holds the crook and um, flail, symbols of the right, um, the king's right to rule. You can sort of see them here. Um, and um, the goddess Nekbet, I'm probably saying that wrong, which is usually um, indicated by a vulture, and Wajet, which is um, usually a symbol of a cobra, inlaid with semi-precious stones, stretch their wings across his torso. So let me go back. I'll kind of zoom in here. So here you can see the crook and the um, and the, the flail. And I know it's hard to see these these other the the symbols of the um, god and goddesses, but they're there. And um, beneath these goddesses are two more Iris um, and Nephis, um, and they're etched in gold. Um, they're also etched in gold. This is the death mask from the innermost coffin. Um, and this is considered one of the masterpieces of Egyptian art. It originally rested directly on the shoulders of the mummy inside the innermost gold coffin. It is constructed of two sheets of gold that were hammered together and weighs 22.5 pounds. Tutankhamun is depicted wearing the striped Nimbus headdress. Um, the striped um, headcloth typically worn by pharaohs in ancient Egypt, Egypt um, with the goddess um, Nekbet and Wajet depicted again protecting his brow. So you can see it here, right here and right here. Um, he also wears a false beard that further connects him to the image of God as with the inner of the god as as with the inner coffin. He wears a broad collar which ends in um, terminal shaped as falcon heads. The back of the mask is covered with, um, with spell number 50, 151B from the Book of the Dead. We're going to be learning more about that um, later, which Egyptians used as a roadmap for the afterlife. This particular spell protects the various limbs of Tutankhamun as he moves into the underworld. So there you go, we have the famous um, Tomb of Tutankhamun. Um, there's also a lot of um, really interesting documentaries about Howard Carter and the whole excavation of the tomb, because some people think it was cursed. And um, during the excavation, there was a lot of um, people died. And um, so there's a, there's a whole slew of interesting documentaries about that that you might be interested in. They're very entertaining. So this leads us to our next piece and our last piece um, in Egyptian art. Um, we had just talked about the Book of the Dead and so what you're looking at is um, an actual um, um, image or papyrus um, scroll from um, one such book. By the time of the New Kingdom, Egyptians had come to believe that only an individual whose actions were good would be able to enjoy an afterlife. After death, souls were thought to undergo a last judgment in which Orsus, the god of the underworld, would preside over two tests supervised by Anubis, the jackal-headed god um, of embalming and ceremonies. The deceased were then questioned about their behavior in life before their hearts were weighed against an ostrich feather, a symbol of Mot, the goddess of truth, order, and justice. So this is what we see here. Um, happening in, in this scene right here. And here's the, the, the scroll um, in its entirety. Um, so Hufner and his wife Nasha lived during the 19th dynasty in around 1310 BCE. He was a royal scribe um, and scribe of divine offerings um, is his title. He was also overseer of royal cattle and steward of King um, Seti I. These titles indicate that he held prominent administrative offices that would have been close to the king. The location of his tomb is not known, but he may have been buried at Memphis. The scroll, which is 
found in a sort of um, Orsis um, figure. Um, it was found inside, um, and, and um, this papyrus scroll was found, um, are the only objects which can be ascribed to Hunifer. The papyrus of Hunifer is characterized by its good state of preservation, and the large, um, clear vignettes or illustrations are beautifully drawn and painted. Um, the vignette illustrating the open of the mouth ritual is one of the most famous pieces of papyrus in the British Museum collection and gives a great deal of information about this part of the funeral. So the centerpiece of the upper scene um, is the mummy of Hunifer, um, shown supported by the god Anubis, or a priest wearing a jackal mask. Um, Hunifer's wife and daughter mourn, and three priests perform rituals. The two priests with white sashes are carrying out the open of the mouth ritual. The white building at the right is a representation of the tomb, complete with portal, doorways, um, and a small pyramid. Both these features can be seen in real tombs to this date from Thebes. To the left of the tomb is a picture of the stela, which would have stood to one side of the tomb entrance. Um, remember, a stela or stela is a, a sort of marker, um, stone marker. Following the normal conventions of Egyptian art, it is shown much larger than normal size in order that its content, um, the deceased worshiping Orsus, together with a standard um, offering formula, is um, absolutely clear and legible. So this is what I'm talking about here. This, And it almost reminds me of the, it really does look like the Code of Hammurabi, um, especially here, this exchange up here. Um, it's not there, so don't get them confused. This is a different stele being depicted. At the right of the lower scene is a table bearing the various implements needed for the open of the mouth ritual. At the left um, is shown um, a ritual where the foreleg of a calf cut off while the animal is alive is offered. The animal was then sacrificed. The calf is shown together with its mother, who might have been interpreted as showing signs of um, distress. So here you see that here. Yeah, she didn't, you know, yeah, if we look in her face, she does kind of look a little upset. So the scenes um, read from left to right. Um, to the left, Anubis brings Hunifer into the judgment area. Anubis is also shown supervising the judgment scales. Hunifer's heart, represented as a pot, is being weighed against a feather, the symbol of Mott, the established order of things. In this context, meaning what is right, um, so this idea of if, if, if he deserved um, to, to have a, an afterlife. Um, the ancient Egyptians believed that the heart was the seat of emotions. Um, the, intel the intellect and the character and thus um, represented the good or bad aspects of a person's life. If the heart did not balance with the feather, then the dead person was condemned to non-existence and consumption by the ferocious devourer, um, which is indicated by the strange beast shown here, which looks like it's part um, crocodile, um, part lion, and part hippopotamus. Some other features that we see depicted is Hunifer is shown to the right, brought into the presence of Orsus by his son Horus, having um, become true of voice or justified. Um, this was a standard epitaph, epitaph applied to dead individuals in their text. Orsus is shown seated under a canopy um, with his sisters Isis and Nephthys. At the top, Hunifer is shown adoring a row of deities who supervised um, the judgment. So again, this is probably one of the most beautiful exam examples of um, the Book of the Dead and, the, and, and a, papy a papyrus scroll. Um, this is the last piece that we're going to be looking at with Egyptian art. It looks like it's finished recording in time. Um, so stay tuned to our next subunit.